All right, welcome back to Fun Training Modern Fortran Basics Day 1 Part 2. So let's go ahead and dive into it. A reminder of the agenda. So for Part 2, we're going to be talking about uh, modern control constructs and then how to kind of start organizing your source code at, for larger projects using modules and submodules. So first, untangling spaghetti. So if you've been around some of the legacy code bases in Fortran, you will inadvertent, you will invariably have seen go-to statements, or at least statement labels. Uh, th there's some interesting features that were available back then, but which really have some more usable, understandable, safer modern equivalents for patterns you may have seen. So let's go over some of those. Um, conditional or branching constructs. So in the before times when Fortran was just just starting to get get going, um, we hadn't really discovered that they were there were these patterns in terms of conditional constructs or looping constructs that really could be standardized. Uh, basically, we just had jumps go to some other place in the program. There were a couple, there were a few interesting features that Fortran had that we'll talk about that, that could do this. The quintessential one was go to. Uh, there were a few different forms of kind of go to statements. First was just go to some other place in the program, which was just unconditionally. We, we went from one place in the program to the next. Um, there was this, there was one called uh, computed go to, which would, the value of an integer variable would determine which of the labels in the list it was supposed to go to. And then we had a, a let's see, uh, what was the name of it? Uh, an arithmetic if. Uh, so you could put an integer expression in the parentheses, and depending on whether that evaluated to negative, zero, or one, it would go to either the first, second, or third. Or negative, zero, or positive, it would go to either the first, second, or third labels listed. Uh, the new style is use if then else blocks, use select case blocks. Uh, let's look at an example of something like that. So, um, just some, you know, simple program that would just demonstrate the idea here. Uh, the old style that you may have seen is, you know, we'll, we'll, is it option one, two, or three? And the way you could implement that was you had uh, computed go to, right? It would go to, and and what the way it was stated was that if the value of the variable didn't was outside of the range of one to however many items in the list, it would just go to the next statement. So, so this would be your kind of else clause, like, oh, I better go down here and do that. And so you'd have to very carefully orchestrate your go-to statements to get the actual effect you wanted. Uh, or similarly, you could do uh, the arithmetic if, so negative, zero, or positive, the equivalent of that is select case. So you can say, given the value of, of some variable, select which one I want. There's a default option. So this is the syntax for that. Select case, some value, in case. There are, there are fancier things that you can start to do with the, the case statements. Um, you can start to use ranges. Uh, for for some of them uh, and then case default is well it doesn't match any of those so do do this other thing um, or uh, for something equivalent to down here you would use something like if then else blocks so if i was less than zero your number was negative one thing you'll start to notice as we go through more of these two is the logic ends up kind of being sometimes backwards or inside out or something like that, right? So over here we said 
we, we, we listed the statements in the order of your number was negative, your number was zero, your number was positive. In order for the logic to end up working out, sometimes you have to rearrange things a little bit. But we'll, let's go compile those. Uh, oh, I have to re-s alloc to get another ad interactive session on a node. While we wait for that, I will go open up that. Let's see. Mm, do, 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 control flow, examples, conditional. Right, so this is the old style with the go to's, is in conditional, and then modern conditional for the new style. And then we'll hopefully that should be ready any minute now. Well, rather than just sit there and wait for that, we'll we'll come back to it here in a second. Let's let's go ahead and start looking at the looping constructs. Um, Answer questions in the chat. Do we have a couple of questions in the chat? Um, or the Google Doc? We can we can take a quick look. Um, are there timing differences between case and if statement? Um, the case statements can the select case statements can work a little faster than if statements for the reason that. Um, under the hood, it can use go to. So it can do something like the computed go to or something like that to actually implement this. But there's no mistake of you getting all of the labels and go to's incorrect with the select case statement. Whereas with the if else statements, it does actually have to evaluate each condition in the order listed to see which block it's going to go into. Because what in, in in this case it knows I you know if, if the user input two it jumps down to here does this and then it jumps out whereas here if you input the value two it would have to do this check then it comes down here and does this check it goes oh yes it's positive print that and then jump to the end of the if block right so under the hood you know what what the the code the compiler actually produces, like the, the actual machine instructions do amount to go to's. But this is the, the safer way to not make a mistake and make the code easier to understand, right? If you look at those, those two options side by side, you're, you really are in a situation where the, this is hard to follow. I've kind of explained what the pattern is, and it's kind of, you can kind of guess the idea from some of the variable names and, and strings here, but in really complicated code, it becomes nearly impossible to follow what, what's going to happen. Whereas here, it, the, the pattern is very clear. It's like, we're going to do one of these things based on the variable, based on the value of the variable. We're going to one of these things is going to happen we will and we'll go in order trying to see if if that evaluates to true um let's see still waiting for that so uh it it'll come on here in a minute but uh we'll we'll look a little bit at the the looping constructs so like i said at one point the only way you could do this was with go to's so you would have to orchestrate conditions at where you would go from, you would go backwards through the program. Rather than jump forward, you would jump backwards. And make sure you changed something about the state of your program such that eventually you did jump forwards. Um, we did end up getting some do, do like loop like constructs. So there, I'll, I'll point out an interesting tidbit in a minute that 
there's actually some unsafety here as well, depending on like the style you were using at the time. Uh, there, there was a, there were bugs here that could occur that were really tricky to find. Um, now we have explicit looping constructs that work really well. Uh, one of them is do concurrent uh, that is specifically kind of designed to enable parallel processing, i.e., and, and and several of the compilers have started to look at that and go, oh, we could automatically just put that on a GPU. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so an example. So like I said, an old an old way that you might have done something like this looping construct is uh, you have a label that says a, a continue statement was basically a do nothing statement. It was just a place that you could put a label so you'd have a place to jump to. Then you would do, you know, some con conditionally do some go to. Uh, so this is like the modern if statement. So this is going to evaluate to true or false. And then this only gets this statement only gets executed if this expression is true, right? So if that's true, we'll skip the print statement. Make sure we increment i. If i is greater than some condition, we'll jump out of the loop. Otherwise, we go back, right? I, and I've indented this to help illustrate that, yes, this is the looping construct. But frequently, you would see the code written without being indented. Additionally, this other this uh, was another form that came along where you could explicitly label your do, you, you'd have a do statement with a corresponding continue the, uh, where the labels match. And it would know, oh, when I get here, I'm supposed to come back and evaluate that expression and only go and, and increment this up until some limit and then, and then continue after. Um, so you could do, but you could do something like this and still jump to the end of the loop Right, so if you wanted to skip the rest of the loop. There were frequent reports of bugs occurring in statements like these because uh, up until Fortran 90 when we got free format source form, if anybody of you have heard of fixed format source, where the code started at column 7 and had to end before column 72 and everything else the first six columns were reserved for special meaning, and the, everything after column 72 was ignored. Another aspect of that format for the source code was that white space was irrelevant. It, it, it was ignored. So if you inadvertently typed a dot instead of a comma on this line, this means something completely different. In, instead of saying this is the beginning of some loop, this would be a variable named do100i, assign the value 1.10 to that variable, and then continue on. And people would be completely confused why their loops weren't being executed more than once. But it was inadvertently a typo that the implicit typing just declared a variable and assigned to it and then went on, and then this continue statement was just you know, a do nothing statement. So uh, it is highly recommended not to use this form anymore and definitely don't use go to's anymore because it's hard to follow. So the modern equivalents are, uh, you can have a, just an empty do loop and this is an infinite loop because there are no loop bounds and no condition. So you have to make sure you have an explicit exit statement that says, jump out of the, the loop. There's also the cycle statement, which is equivalent to this, uh, would have been equivalent to, uh, it, it, it jumps back to the start of the loop, we'll put it that way. Uh, and then, you know, the, the print, which was what our, our original intent was. So you have to make sure you've got some something that you're changing some condition that will exit the loop, and you can optionally cycle so to, to skip the rest of the loop. There's also the do while loop. So you can put some condition here 
but make sure you're changing something within the body of the loop so eventually that condition will be false otherwise you'll end up with an infinite loop um, it still supports the cycle statement it still supports the exit statement as well so you can you can do complicated things there as well um, and then finally there's the, the equivalent to this form um, and for the purposes of the logic we're actually trying to to do here which is you can you can put an increment size for as it increments through the loop let's see if yes we have so we can look at our examples here so ftn let's see let's look at conditional first as soon as we get to the right place Right, so by default, it's it's war. The compiler's even without any compiler flags. The compiler's going to go, hey, that's a deleted feature. It means the the standard says, hey, this feature you don't have to support this feature anymore. Um, but the program does still work. You can the logic can still work. Um, but really, you should do the modern equivalent, three and four, right? Um, then for the loops, so those loops, we can compile them and see what that does. Prints the odd integers from one to nine. But again, the modern equivalent does the same thing. And I did it three different ways instead of two. Okay, moving along. But let's let's take a sec and look at the questions, see if there's any interesting questions. Can you comment on the where construct? Oh, that's a fun one. Where is was intended to be somewhat of a parallel construct uh, as was for all for all was made was declared obsolescent when we got to concurrent but where is still available where's an interesting one so you can say something like okay, let's do where where example so let's say I've got an ar where is specifically to operate on arrays so let's say I've got uh, an array of some size one two three four five six seven So where a is, uh, let's say mod a two equals zero print a. I think that works. I don't use where very often, but there are certain cases where it's pretty neat. Uh, syntax error in where statement. Um, but I, like I said, I don't use it very often, so I don't remember exactly what the syntax is. But pretty sure that works. Oh, but you can't do those things. Yeah, you can't you can't do IO in a where statement. That's what I thought. Um, but I can do something like and then we can print B.
right? So this only assigned, it only did the assignments where this statement was true for that array. So it, it basically can create a, it's called a logical mask and executes these statements for that, the places where that is true in an array. And so, you, but you can also do something like elsewhere to not have undefined values. You can do something like that. So where where's kind of a somewhere between conditional and looping construct? It's like a, an interesting combination of them. Um, you, you can do more than just assignment, uh, performs masked operations. And so you, you could call the subroutine, you can, you can have a whole block of code in there. The, the use cases get slightly weird if you start to do much more complicated, but, but they, they were kind of intended to be like uh, a signal to the compiler, like, hey, you can do like all of this in parallel. Here, here's the explanation of like the conditionals about what I want you to do when. Um, all right, uh, back to presentation. So we did looping constructs, error handling. Um, it used to be pretty common practice that if, if you had some procedure that some error condition could occur, what you would do is you would put like recovery type code, like close a file or print some errors, error message to the screen, whatever. At the end of the procedure, put a, have a return statement before that error handling code and then have a, a label that you would jump to when, when certain error conditions would occur. There is, that, that would use go to's obviously, but there is a kind of more modern construct that you could use. You can, you can name blocks of code and the exit statement can be used to exit named blocks of code. So you would see something like, you know, print, there are no real roots, right? So if some condition jumped to the end, and then we have a stop statement. So, so under normal execution, we get to the stop statement and this code doesn't get executed. But if that error condition occurs, we jump after the stop statement and do some error handling. The modern equivalent, like I said, is you can have a, oh, clicking, uh, you can have a named block. So you can put a name, there's a, it's a label in front of block with a colon and then you have to put that same label at the end but an exit statement can refer to it and that says jump out of this block and so you can do this as a modern equivalent so we'll go compile that example let's go look at that example so errors right so we're gonna do some Find the roots of some quadratic errors. So if we do like one, three, one, we get some roots. But if we do three, one, three, there are no real roots, right? So that's that's the behavior that we'd like to have, right? We can we can accomplish the same thing with this named block. FTN modern errors. All right, so one, three, one. It doesn't exit that block and we hit the stop statement and it doesn't print the print the real roots. Or do three one three. This exit statement jumps out of the block. We get there are no real roots. So that's like mod that's your modern error handling alternative to what would have been a common usage of go to.
So let's take a quick look and see if there's any questions there. Um, not, not so far. Okay. All right. One more kind of interesting aspect of go to would be something called alternate return. You could define a procedure that took as an argument a set of labels that it might be able to jump to outside of it under certain conditions. So you would see, so you would see the same kind of pattern, but it's trying to like hit, allow the the procedure it's about to call to jump to the end to do the error handling. Um, the new style, which is the way pretty much all of the intrinsic subroutines and a lot of statements, they have a stat argument, an optional stat argument, which is, uh, did something go wrong? And so the you should follow that convention and have optional stat arguments to your procedures that might go wrong. And then you can say, if that was, you can use that same block trick of, if that argument wasn't, if it didn't return zero, i.e. everything's okay, then you can exit and do the error handling. So the example of something like this would have been, I have some subroutine divide. Basically, you in your argument list, you would have a star here, and then your return statement would say, return to the first label in the in the list of labels in the in the actual argument list. And so you could actually have multiple. So if you wanted to handle different error conditions differently, you could you could do uh, a, a, ver a variety of those. Um, so typically, what you would do is, uh, in the modern context, you would say, "We'll have a stat argument. If the thing was going to go wrong, set that stat argument to something non-zero, and return." Although in this case, we can just do an if else. Uh, Otherwise, do the normal thing. Make make sure you set the stat argument to zero. So you can kind of rework this in terms of having a stat argument instead of alternate returns. And then you'll do if stat not equals zero. If you wanted to have multiple different error conditions that you wanted to to handle, you're, you'd have the different values for your error codes, and you could do a select case at the at at your error condition handling thing. So uh, go, go compile and execute that uh, return. Yeah, so, so the alternate return. FTN return. Uh, one and two, we get integer division. But one and zero, we get something went wrong, right? So that that alternate return allows the the program to jump from inside of a procedure to someplace outside of it. But the modern equivalent would be that stat argument and exit check it exit the block. So we got, you know, do the division, but if we try and divide some, divide by zero, something went wrong. So you can get the equivalent behavior with that kind of a pattern. So let's see. Actually, I think I had an, an exercise. So let's let me get you started on the exercise here real quick. So. With the different patterns that I've shown you so far, the, the name of the program is a subtle hint, but this does some algorithm that I have shown you so far, that we've, we've seen an example of so far. See if you can convert the go-tos into explicit loops and conditionals.
as an exercise. And then, so I'll give you, this one can, can take a while and I will give you a hint, do it in very short steps. See if you can identify a place where you've got this pattern that you've seen, like, oh, well, the modern equivalent is this. Do it piece by piece, like one thing at a time. But while you're working on that, I can go look at questions. Uh, with the error block, will it not continue after the block is over and print that there are no roots or just stop? So stop is end the program. Yeah, stop statement. Yep, if, it, if a stop statement is reached, the program terminates. Yep. You got it. That answer is correct. How do you refactor a cleanup block? I.e. do something if go to cleanup. Um, well, so yeah, you kind of have to, you end up having to turn things a little bit inside out. Like I've, like I kind of said before, um, but some, so something like this, you'll have this cleanup block will end up at the end after the return. You put a named block that goes from just before whatever the or potentially error condition and ends af right after the return statement. And so your, your if error go to cleanup becomes if error exit block. Yeah, so it would look something like Uh, technically, it's cleaning up the allocation. So uh, I was asking that one. So uh, oh. you want to always uh, allocate, uh, but if an error happens, you want to deallocate early to clean up. Exiting the subroutine does that. This is a local variable. When you exit the subroutine, it is deallocated automatically. What if it is a module variable? So it's not like uh, within like. Okay, in that can in that case, yes. You, but it's the same. It's the same thing, right? You you're wanting to clean up and then get out, right? So. Yeah. And the cleanup so, has to be done every time, like uh, regardless of error or not. You still need to clean up, right? Sure. So then you don't need the return state. So if you're, say, you're saying somewhere in here, something might go wrong. Uh, and you don't even need this block. Right? I see. So it's similar to the approach uh, previously. Mm -hmm. yeah, so have similar the to... error prone one inside the block. Uh, it's yep. like a try catch thing then. It can kind of look similar, yeah. So um, next one, interesting stat argument. Uh, so uh, no, the, this is not special to the compiler. It is only that the language has used this pattern in some of the procedures that it defines. So if you follow that pattern, it will look familiar to people who are familiar with the language. Um, but you would still need to say intent out, define it as an argument. Let's see, where are we? We're still disentangling the spaghetti. 
Um, does anybody want some more time? You can do a hand raise if you want some more time. Otherwise, I can uh, I can kind of show show an example of of how you might kind of work through disentangling this. We got we got one hand raised, so I I suppose I can give another minute or two. Let's see if there's any more questions. All right, well, let's, let's start looking at this exercise. So first of all, one suggestion is, well, let's see if we can find out what it does. Find up to... I don't know, 10, 2, 3, 5, 7. That looks oddly familiar. How about 20? Yeah, I think I see what it does. Well, let's see if we can kind of uh, start rearranging this. So I notice we can pretend, we'll potentially go to 6. So that looks like there but otherwise we go to one okay so this starts to look like a loop it starts here and ends here with this as the condition so I'll say do while but I have to I'm going to have to invert this condition because it was going to jump after the loop if that was true. Ah. But now I have a I was going to go to 5. So I think and and 5 was going to go to 1, so that was effectively a cycle. So let's see if it still does that. Yep. All right. So this is this is the pattern that you'll see is you'll kind of slowly see if you can identify one pattern that is equivalent to some modern construct like do while. See if you can make that one little change with the equivalent things and then see if the program still works. And then to be nice to those that come after me, add the indentation. <laughs> so like the next one. So this go to two, else go to three, right, which is after. So this is starting to look like another loop. So I can do that same trick, say do while. invert that condition and and do and that go to was already equivalent so let's see if that still does what we wanted ah we ended up with an extra thing So 
I took a wrong step at some point. So, go to two. If ah, I know what I, I know what I did wrong. I inverted that condition almost instead of the the inverse of greater than is less than or equal to. There we go. There, there are three hard programs, or there are three hard pro problems in computer science: cache invalidation, naming things, and off by one errors. Um, anyway, uh, so, so like, like I said, you can kind of repeat this process until you end up with all of your go-tos have been removed. And for those of you who who got the hint, this is the sieve of Eratosthenes to find primes, which was a program that I showed earlier. So let's move on again. Or actually, we better go look at questions. Are there any automated tools to change the old control flow to modern equivalents? I gave up on ChatGPT. Um, I think I think there have been some people trying to play with ChatGPT. I do know of a couple of commercial tools that make some claims to be able to do a lot of this. I think FPT is one that I've heard of. Um, there might be another one, but the name escapes me. Um, there, there are some tools out there that can be useful in converting legacy code into more modern equivalents. Um, Google around, they're, they're out there. That's a good question. Uh, do. All right, getting organized. So in the old times, you there weren't there weren't modules. You basically defined your procedures in separate files a lot of times, and then you can just compile them independently and hope that you called them correctly. There's there's modern ways of really improving the situation and allowing the compiler to check your work much better. Uh, so in the old style, you, I mean, in this case, we'll have everything in one file, but the procedures here have what is called implicit interfaces. The compiler is in no way obligated to check that the arguments here match, that their types match, that there's the same number of them, that they're in the right order, et cetera. Like, the compiler is in no way obligated to check that you have called these procedures correctly because they could have been in separate files that it might not even see while you're compiling the program or that they call each other. They might be, you know, they might be in separate files, but the compiler is not obligated to check that you've called them correctly. At most, you should, you, you might define the type of the result of a function. Like I said, this is error prone because the compiler is not trying to check you at all in, did you call this procedure correctly? Is this going to work? So let's go, let's go and look at modules. Samples. Implicit. Implicit. 
I mean, it does still work. It, we can calculate the Fibonacci number, call show. Like it's, it, this works because I was lucky enough to write it correctly. But if I said, um, we got lucky here because Because this procedure is in the same file, the compiler is nice enough to check it for me. But there are certain cases, there are certain times where it uh, it wouldn't, right? In this case, again, because it's in the same file, it's able to see that and tell me about it. But if they're in separate files, it's just going to go, well, I, I guess you know what you're doing. Um, so the minimal step that you should take is they, they, they added something to the implicit none statement at one point. Say, well, not only make sure that I declare my variables, Make sure that all of my all of the procedures I call have explicit interfaces, so that you can check me when I try and call them. So basically, what that's going to say is that that explicit interfaces works the same, but if I don't give those interfaces. It tells me that I didn't declare the interface for this. So I recommend starting to add these to your to your implicit none statements. And then we can talk about interfaces. So this is called an interface block. And then each thing in there is an interface body. You're saying the function named Fibonacci will take these arguments. The weird thing is interfaces don't have what's called host association, and they don't inherit the implicit none rules. So you have to repeat implicit none, and if you actually need to refer to anything that's present in the external scope, you need an import statement to say, uh, also give me access to that other thing that's out there. But it at least does now give you the safety of, if you hit save, uh, the, comp the compiler will now see what the interface to this procedure is and make sure that the way you've called it matches that interface. There is one caveat. <laughs> if this procedure is still in a separate file, oh, I uh, made a typo there. You just lied to the compiler about what the interface is. It, it it happens to be in the right file, or they happen to be in the same file, so the compiler can warn me about it. But it's just a warning. So basically, you set you set an interface here, but the interface that that's not what the actual interface is. So you can you can end up inadvertently lying to the compiler about how am I supposed to call this procedure? So it's, so this is a decent first step, but you should go ahead and take the next step. And that's to put your procedures in modules. So module is a 
it's a program unit where I can say where I can define I can define uh, variables. I don't do that all that often, but you you can there's a a specification section is what it's called where you can put type definitions, variable declarations, interfaces, etc. Um, you can explicitly say whether things are available from out accessible from outside the module, uh, public or private. Private says it's <coughs> only the things inside the module can access this. Um, so you can say things are private by default and then explicitly list the things that you want to be accessible from outside the module. I, that's typically my practice is I, I, right at the top I say implicit none, private, here are the things that this module provides. So you, so like the, as you're starting to look through a module you can like immediately go, oh here are the things that I'm allowed to use from here. And then after a contained statement you define procedures. Right? Procedures defined here implicitly get an explicit interface, right? Its interface is defined here, so when it compiles the module, it knows what the interface is. And then when you use the module, the compiler is ob obliged to go find that module that's been compiled already and check that the interfaces match. Another thing that's common to do is use the only clause to say explicitly, these are the things I want to use from that module, and I recommend doing that as well. If for no other reason that when I'm scrolling down here and I go, where did that come from? You've got 15 modules you used. I don't know which one to go look in. That at the very least, it helps with something like that. Um, but it can also be like, I don't need everything from that module, or these two modules I want to use, I don't, there's a thing in there with the same name, but I only need one of them. If they have the same name, I, I can't actually bring them both into scope, and then you have to use the only clause. So uh, I, my habit is to just always say only and list the things I'm going to use. But uh, when we compile that, it also produces another another file as it compiles it called the utils.mod, right? So it compiles the module, produces this file, which then when it sees a use statement, it goes and looks in there and looks at the interfaces. So it saves the interfaces to the procedures in that mod file so that when it sees a use statement, it can go look at them. And so the consequence here is that I actually have to have this module appear if I'm if I'm going to put the modules in the same file they have to appear before they're used if because it's got a it's going to compile that file in order and so it has to compile the module before anything that uses it it's that way it can produce that mod file and look at that but we can run it and see that it does in fact still have the same behavior we can then take one more kind of fancy-ish step, and that is we can go that extra rep, that uh, go back to that that place where I was going to define the interfaces where I wanted to use them. But in this case, I can actually not have to repeat them. And I can actually compile them separately again. So we still have that module. We still say implicit none. We say module function. And that, sa that says I'm defining the interface here for a procedure that is in this module. And we got something a little extra with this module function. 
when you say when you say module function or module subroutine for an interface, it still doesn't get the implicit typing rules, but it does get host association. So if there's a derived type or a variable or something something in the in the module that you want to make use of in the interface, you don't need the import statement. But at any rate, so I've got a module that only defines the interfaces for these procedures. I'm still then I am then allowed to use the module because the compiler will have compiled this module, stored those interfaces. It can look at the interfaces. When I so when I call the procedures, it it's looked in that module to see the interfaces for them. And then I have a submodule. The syntax for submodule is submodule, the name of the module that it depends on, right? So uh, this is an ex this is kind of an extension from the utils module. And then the name of the submodule. And you can actually like nest these. Um, so you can have a submodule that's yeah, they call them child and parent. So you can have a uh, submodule that's a child of a submodule that's a child of a submodule, right? But uh, and then I have to go remind myself of the syntax. I think you I, th I think you just have to put the one parent there. But at any rate, um, but then when I have the procedure, I can just say module procedure Fibonacci. So it says go the parent module defines this interface. I don't have to repeat it, but this is the implementation of that. So you can separate the implementation and the interface now. The neat part was I was able to use the module before it saw the submodule. The submodule can be compiled compiled independently of the program now. So this can end up helping you in terms of being able to do uh, parallel comp comp parallel compilation when you have large projects, right? So if so if you've got some large project that has to be compiled in a specific order because you're using modules. Well, if you take most of the executable code and put it in a submodule, now all of that code can be compiled independently. The the caveat is you have to compile the module before the submodule, but now you can do kind of independent uh, parallel separate compilation again and still have explicit interfaces. So you can compile and execute it and we still get the same behavior. Um, the the interesting implications, though, is that nothing can see what's in a submodule. You can do a child submodule, but it can still, which which can see inside that submodule, but nothing can see inside of it, right? Um, so. Anything that you want to have access to in a module needs to still be declared, or at least have its interface declared in the module. Because um, I'm only saying use that module. There's there's no way for the compiler to know that there might be a submodule because I could have defined everything in the module. So there's no there's no implication that it has to go find find the module and any of its submodules or anything like that. It's just no it, everything the only things that are accessible from that module are the things that are declared in the module. So um, we kind of looked at doing explicit interfaces. Putting procedures in modules instead, and then 
you can separate the interface from the implementation by splitting that back up into a module and a submodule. Um, so now I have an exercise for you. Take the quadratic root finder that I've demonstrated once before uh, and split this in, put this into a module and a submodule. So along the same lines of where I took these procedures and put interface in a module, implementation in a submodule, go put implicit implicit none type external here at the top, add use statement, put these things in modules and submodules and see if you can get that to work. And so I'll give everybody a little bit to work on that and I will go start looking at questions. Which standard introduced implicit none external? I want to say 2008, but I'd have to go double check. I don't remember off the top of my head. Somebody, somebody wrote down 2018, so maybe it was 2018. Any compiler flags that enforce the same effect as type external? Uh, yes. There, I believe, for G-Fortran, it is. Let me go look at the... My listing of them. The implicit interface will yell at you about if you're calling procedures with an implicit interface and then the dash w error turns those into errors. And then I don't use it because I get into the habit of having implicit none um, but there's also a f there's also a flag to turn off implicit typing to effectively have implicit none everywhere without saying it. But I'd have to I have to remember what the flag is. Um, yeah. Yeah. I I recommend having all of your code in modules and use modules because that will that will work. That, that will always work. Can you please elaborate on why, when we need to use interface? Um, oh, there's actually some cases where you absolutely have to have an explicit interface. Uh, it has to do with certain uh, argument attributes. So if you want to If you want to do assumed shape, that has to have an explicit interface. Um, if you want to do allocatable or pointer or target, those have to have explicit interfaces. There are some, it, it turns out that in those cases you can't quite tell that you're gonna need an explicit interface just from the call site but there are some cases and I have to think a little harder about what those are exactly there are some cases where you can even tell from the call site I have to think Yeah, I don't remember exactly what those are, though. Can we say that best practice recommendation is to use implicit none type external? Yeah, uh, I would say that. It's just, it, you're just being explicit to the compiler is saying, like, hey, make sure you check all the things that you're, that you're supposed to. of 
recursive. Ah, so recursive is at the moment kind of in a halfway point. Technically, the standard says that all procedures are recursive by default. It didn't used to say that. And so anytime you wanted a recursive procedure, you had to say it. That being said, some of the compilers haven't quite caught up with that yet. And so we're at a stage right now where it's still good practice to be more portable to say recursive when you're actually doing it. But strictly, that's not necessary. One thing that I think, yeah, so one of the things about if a procedure is recursive, you have to have a result variable instead of just assuming that the result variable has the same name as the function. Because that's that's the default. If you don't say result something, the, val the, the variable that is the function result has the same name as the function. But then I can't call the function with that name because that's the name of the result variable. Like they're, they're the same thing. So when you want to say something is recursive, um, you have to have this. Everything is recursive by default now. But what will happen is if I don't say recursive, it will just kind of go, well, I guess it's it might be recursive. But then I would say I would, you know, write something like this. And then at this line, it's going to go, you can't call. Oh, it's probably going to say something like Fibonacci is not an array or something like that. You're going to get a weird error message here. I mean, it looks like I'm trying to call the function, but that's not allowed because the function has the same name as its result. And so really what that's going to say, if you, if being explicit about it is just going to let you kind of go, let the compiler know that, hey, you're going to want this to be recursive. It can actually look right there and go, oh, but you didn't provide a result variable, so you're not going to actually be able to call it. So uh, shall we go ahead and go through the exercise of splitting this up? All right, let's do that. Oh, you might also notice when you start putting things in submodules. Uh, when I compile the utils module, because I've said module procedure, or module function, or module subroutine, the compiler produce, also produces something. It says, oh, you're going to have a submodule. So it produces another file that is for the submodule to look at. So that when you say, hey, my parent module is this one, it goes and looks at the .smod file. And then when it compiles the submodule, you might also have children of that submodule, so it gets its own smod file as well. And so there's some additional files that get created as you're doing the compilation. But let's go check out the exercise. So. Uh, 
first thing is I define a module. I'm going to put implicit none type external top contains cut paste those procedures get my indentation correct and then use it and put the nope, the implicit statement goes after the use statements and now those come from the use statement that still works right so so putting procedures in modules like that first step is almost as easy as it could possibly be you just write a module cut and paste your existing procedures into there after a contained statement like there's really not much more to it than that the next step of defining a if I want to go ahead and take that next step and put them into a submodule, I do interface and interface. I'm going to start with that. And I'm going to go ahead and do submodule roots, roots s. And that's just kind of my convention is I, I typically will put underscore m at the as the name of a module. And then underscore s is the name of the submodule. Then I've got a contain statement. Those are just going to be module procedures. So I'll probably, yeah, module procedure root one and procedure and module procedure root two and procedure so that I can grab the implementation, cut and paste that. And then make sure I've got my implicit none statement. And then Basically, I can just delete the contain statement and put the module keyword in front. The tricky part that I occasionally will forget put the implicit none statements in. The interfaces. Whoop. There's the first error. One must be in a generic module interface. Oh, yeah, I got the names wrong. There we go. So we've taken what was not particularly safe code and given our procedures explicit interfaces, re-allowed for separate compilation, and we're back into kind of best pra current best practices. This this has the added benefit of the one of the things about well written well structured code is if things are named well and behave well i should be able to understand how to use some code that you've written without having to understand how it does what it does i should be able to just see what what's the name of the procedure what are its arguments what are their types 
And then I go, oh, well, now I know how to call that thing. And if it's got a reasonably descriptive name, I know what it does. That's all I need to know. This allows you to kind of get back to that stage of like, I just need to look at your module, which has the, the function names and interfaces. I don't have to go look at your submodule anymore. Like that, that's the, that's the details of how it gets done, but I don't have to worry about that if that's not what I'm going to be modifying. I can just look at this is, this is how I use it. So we still have about 45 minutes left scheduled. We managed to run through a lot of those examples really fast. Let me go look at the questions. Um, oh, yep. Yeah, uh, How to define interfaces for C, C++ functions. Oh, this is fun stuff. Uh, bind C, yep. There are, some, there are some certain rules about what's a, what you're allowed to put bind C on. And some of the behaviors about them kind of that, that happen on the C side. But... This is a fun one to try and do live. So let's do C interop. So we've got a program. We're going to use best practices. Um, let's see, what should we have the C thing do? How about, let, let's have it oh, do the a, a standard C library um, that's not available in Fortran, maybe, like uh, put S or no, um, get time of day or something. Um, I'm not. I'm not much of a C programmer, so I don't have all of those memorized, but I was just going to have it say, I was just going to have, let's do our, uh, our roots exercise. So we've got, because these are, in fact, C interoperable. Um, you can say name equals, but if you just want it to be the same, it is by default. It, it takes that name. Um, one of the things is you want to be careful about your types. ISO C binding. Um, C float or C double. Uh, yeah, we'll do C float. I think that's it. You want to make sure that you're telling the compiler the, that the sizes of your types are going to line up, right? So the the standard doesn't say that the default real is the same as flo a C float. So uh, the ISO C binding module defines some kind parameters that say that this is supposed to correspond to what that the companion C processor types are. Uh, there is no underscore T for C float. Is that right? 
Yeah, just check uh, MFE. Okay. Oh. Well, I'm going to check the standard because some of them do and some of them don't have underscore T. Well, the examples in the standard that I first come upon don't have it, so that must be right. And then it's uh, name types like in eight, in sixteen that have the underscore T, I think. Ah, okay, that could be it. Anyway, um, but because this is not module function, I need import C float. You can instead put the use statements here. It's kind of personal preference on that one. Um, but anyway, uh, so now I can grab my exercise here. We're going to just do this. OK, so. I've said what the interfaces are, that they're going to be bind C. So we can call them. We need to go define them somewhere. Let's just do this so I can see what their implementation looks like. But um, extern uh, greater root. So the extern keyword in C says it is effectively the bind something name equals, right? So that, this, that turns off the name mangling. And now we said it takes three arguments. They are floats, A, B, and C. Don't you also need the type uh, extern float greater root? Yep. Um, here's an interesting one that I almost forgot about. Right, otherwise it will be by reference. Yep. So C is defaults pass by value, whereas Fortran defaults pass by reference. So value says make a copy of it and hand it to C. Otherwise, you have to use pointers on the C side. And I'd rather just avoid that function. Why does it? Well, we'll see what the compiler. Ah, I know what it. There we go. That's better. OK. And then we can do, is the syntax for exponentiation the same in C? Uh, no, I think it's uh, pow or just b uh, times b is better. OK. b times b, yep. And for square root, I think you need to math. Ah. Uh, include math.h yes is that right okay it is minus of that so now it's um cc is the cray wrapper if i recall that's the yeah. 
roots dot oh I'm in the wrong folder. Uh, C interop sample roots. Right? So that'll compile the C. So there's a dot O there. And then FTN call C dash C. So now we've got a couple of .o files there. Now we can do, because it's Fortran, you should use the Fortran compiler to do the link step. And it's. And because the main program is in Fortran. Yes. Yeah. And it works. So the caveats here are. The arguments must be C interoperable types. So the intrinsics, uh, most of the, so real, integer, logical, and characters a little special um, are interoperable, but you want to make sure you're using the kind parameters that correspond to the, the right types in C. Um, you need to use the value attribute if you're not going to receive it as a pointer on the C side. They, you, can, you can do subroutines. They correspond to void functions in C. Um, let's see. There's a couple of other. There are some other things you can start to get fancy about in that you can pass arrays and some other things. Um, but you need to start learning about C descriptors that started to come up that came about in the 2018 standard. Uh, so basically there's a standardized struct that C gets when you pass this thing that's supposed to be the, the rules start to get complicated, but you can you can actually end up doing some fancy things um, because you get you get what is effectively a bunch of additional information about what was passed, and so you can start doing allocations in C. Um, you can handle arrays uh, more nicely, right? Because you so you can do assumed shape and. The, but the thing you get on the side on the C side isn't an array. It's a struct that describes the bounds and shape and et cetera of, of the array. So there's lots of more fancy things you can start to do, but uh, but this is like the basics of kind of how you get started. Write an interface, put bind C on it, and then you can call things. But the compiler does not check that this interface actually matches this interface. So you have to make sure that you're looking at them very carefully, and make sure that you've got them defined uh, corresponding and that they match. All right, back to more questions. Organizing a project suite of code, do we define the module and submodule in the same file? Uh, no, that's usually not the way I do it. Uh, I usually put them in separate files. We'll talk a little bit. I think we're definitely going to have time to talk about FPM and some stuff. Suffice to say, when you start to put uh, things in modules and submodules and separate files and all of that, you really you you have to have an order of compilation it matters and so you're going to end up with a make file or cmake or auto tools or whatever it is that's going to be your build system that knows how to compile things in the right order and it starts to get a little complicated but generally i use uh, fpm the fortran package manager which makes that really easy. You just put modules in what you put a module and a submodule in separate files. Like everything's in separate files. I got 
my file contains one module or one submodule, and those contain kind of a minimal set of things, right? So I end up with lots of source files. Er, yep. Yep, as, as projects start to get big, it, it becomes way more convenient to have separate files and have a, a good organizational system structure that you keep to. <coughs> and yes, you would need to recompile separately. However, frequently your build system is going to only recompile what is actually needed to be recompiled. So if you can kind of track the dependency, right? If I didn't change this module and these handful of things that depend on it, they don't need to be recompiled. I only, if I make a change over here, I only need to recompile the things that actually depended on it. And so your build system will be, be smarter about not recompiling the things that don't need to be recompiled. And using submodules is one of the aspects that can help with that. If I didn't change the interface to a procedure, I only re need to recompile the submodule and nothing else that depends on that module. I only need to recompile the submodule and relink the program because the interfaces didn't change. So the way that other code calls it doesn't have to change. Yep, that, the, the mod files are compiler dependent. Yeah, that's the caveat. Um, yeah, they're, it can get advanced. Um, this is this is one of the reasons that I like FPM, is because it kind of sandboxes that all for you. It says it it has a different build folder for different compilers with different flags. So like the you don't you don't you don't end up going oh I want to switch compilers I have to delete my whole build folder and start from scratch. And no, you can you can be uh, developing with multiple compilers independently and not have to worry about that. Um, but yeah, do you show us how you check the standards? Uh, so the j3-fortran.org website under documents by year, Usually, there will be a 007.pdf or r1.pdf or r however. This is the draft of the standard as the committee works on it. It is, in theory, publicly available-ish. Uh, you, you can go get a copy there. So. I, I have a copy of the PDF on my machine. I basically pull up the PDF and I just do searching for things like, like I was curious about C float and it just a control F went, oh yeah, it appears that uh, C float is the thing that's defined. Or if we wanna, uh, a lot of times I'll use it for looking at the intrinsic procedures. Yeah, the, the intrinsics section is something that everybody should read. There's tons of stuff in there that you may not have known about. And some of it's really clever and handy. Um, you know, absolute value is a common one. You know, there's uh, all is one that I use a lot, all or any, right? If you've got an array of logical things or uh, multiple logical expressions you want to check, right? Those those are pretty common. So it's, instead of saying this and this and this, or and then having to remember the order of operations or use parentheses or something, uh, you can use like an array of logical expressions and do an any or an all or something like that. Um, let's see, one of my favorite ones is some of my favorite ones are uh, find loc is an interesting one uh, 
It is the position of some value in an array if it if it exists in that array. Hypotenuse was an interesting one, the Euclidean distance function. So normally you'd put something like square root of x squared plus y squared, but if there if the values are very big or very small, there's potential for numerical inconsistencies there. The intrinsic is supposed to not have that problem. It, it's supposed to work across all the whole range reasonably accurately. And then you don't have to manually write it out. Um, Matmol, you don't have to write your own matrix multiplication. It's, it's an intrinsic function of the language. Minloc and minval and maxloc and maxval. So what are the, where does the maximum value occur or what is the maximum value in an array? Move alloc's a good one. Uh, if you've allocated an array, you can change what variable that array has been allocated to. Why do you not why do you not have to say intent out for function results? Function results are not intent out arguments. They are a, a thing in and of themselves. So you can't say intent out for a function result. You could just declare its type. It's all it's already intent out. Um, let's see, where was a good one that I used recently? Uh, spread was an interesting one. Value replicated in a new dimension. So say you've got a, I want an array of 10 of the value 42. You can just write spread 42, 1, comma, 10, comma, 1, comma, 10, right? That's, it's an array of 10, val 10 of the value 42. But you can, you can also do, I've got an array, and I want to do, uh, I want to multiply it across multiple dimensions of a matrix, right? I want this array multiplied with each row of some matrix. You can spread the array and do the matrix multiplication instead of manually handwriting out the loops or whatever. That one's pretty pretty useful. Um, and one that I use pretty regularly is pack array packed into a vector. So given an array and a and an array of logical true falses return me the values in array that correspond to the true values in the mask. So it's so it's a way of shrinking an array. Right? I, go, I need these elements from that array as an array. Reshape. So if you've got an array of one shape and you need it to be a different shape, you can do that. Scan and verify are interesting as uh, character. O often you'll see people use index. That one's pretty common, but uh, scan and verify can be more interesting if you're doing something slightly more complicated. There are also special functions in mathematics like Bessel. Yeah, yeah. There, are, there, okay. yep, there are a few of those. You know, log and sign and and etc are are all in there, but uh, yeah, the Bessel functions are are there. So yeah, it's definitely worth going through 
the list of the intrinsic procedures and kind of familiarizing yourself with what's there. Because a lot of times, I, you see people a lot of times will re-implement and you're going, why didn't you just use the intrinsic? <laughs> A controversial one is a metmol, the matrix multiplication, because mm -hmm. some compilers, they are slower. Some compilers, they are a lot faster because of some uh, secret recipes. <laughs> right. I'm of the opinion that you should be using the intrinsics and conforming to the standard as much as possible, and then and then go push on the compiler writers. And you'll be like, hey, why, why can't you make their, this as fast as they did? It's always uh, so the the standard is always year dash double oh seven. Sometimes R N dot PDF. Um, let's see, link to the recorded meeting. Well, I don't get a link until we're done recording, but uh, I will. I will try and get them out today for for today's sessions, and then I will post them on the uh, on the the training site. So once the, once the recordings are ready, I'll, I'll put the links to them up here, and I'm pretty sure they'll end up on the NERSC YouTube channel as well. And then you want. The link to the current one, I can point you to. Yep. J3 Fortran documents by year. So that is that one. There we go. And that is the the latest one right before the standard is published is pretty much the standard that got published with some minor formatting tweaks. I'll also mention the paper that, uh, is it a John Rate that uh, writes it every time a new standard comes out? Uh, that summarizes oh. the new things in that uh, standard. Yeah, I don't think it has a a known number, but yeah, John Reed, uh, who has been a member of the standards committee for ever, he he writes a a pretty good, concise description of here are the new things in the language every time we are about ready to publish a new standard. We got about 15 more minutes for questions and answers or demonstrations. If anybody wants to see something like that, um, I can, you know, try and try and do some examples, walk through it's, some examples. Uh, if I found the link, mm -hmm. it's um, on five. Uh, I'll copy it in, into the document. Okay. Um, yeah. If there's some example you want me to kind of walk through a little bit more closely if there was some syntax that was confusing to you or some some feature that was new or you didn't quite understand or didn't make a whole lot of sense i could do some of that as well Or if there's a uh, a compiler error that you've seen and you're like, I was completely baffled by this one. Can you explain it? Or <laughs> um, yeah.
Otherwise, I can, any examples of Fortran code project that uses modules and submodules and separate files? Um, yes. Uh, I do a lot of work with Damien Roussan, and that was, that's basically his favorite style. So let's see. Let me... I think it's sorcery institute slash assert. So he's got an assertion utility that basically it's a subroutine that if you if you pass it a true value, it doesn't do anything. If you pass it a false value, it prints a me prints a message you gave it and stops the program. <laughs> but it's callable inside pure procedures and in theory uh, could be eliminated during an optimizing compiler's dead code removal phase by setting a preprocessor macro. So you can do, what does he, have? yeah, he's got an example. Uh, so calculating the roots of a polynomial, assert that the discriminant is, right, so where the discriminant is, you know, the thing inside square root, assert that it's greater than zero. All right, so so if if you tried to run this program, because the discriminant's going to be uh, be negative, it's going to error stop with this message, and it knows how to also print some of the intrinsic types. So you can just give it a, a value there and it goes, uh, this, this assertion failed. So this would be something like uh, assert in C++, which is kind of built into the language, but he's got a library that, that does something similar. But that said, the assert subroutine module just has the interface. And then the implementation is in, in here. In a submodule. Uh, he's, he's also got a couple of additional f features that you could go check out. But that stuff's there. Um, let's see. Other questions? Yeah, if you if you check out a handful, he's got a handful of libraries, and it yeah his his style is to always do module submodule pair. Does Veggies use the same style? I have been semi more reluctant to adopt that style, only because tend to encounter more compiler bugs with submodules, but it's, right. I'm, get, it's I'm getting edge. there. It's cutting edge after all. It's a but, newer feature. Submodules are a newer feature. Yeah, but I, I don't know. It Anyway, what is a good way to write code such that the precision for real can be changed easily without having to change variable types throughout the code base? I usually put this in a types module. Yeah, that's that's kind of the that's kind of the best practice is if you've got a I want my whole program to use the same kinds, then having one place where you define the precision and just use that kind everywhere in your program, yeah, that's that's the best practice. There's interesting discussions that can be had about if you're doing mixed precision stuff how do you define what the different kinds are when should you do what conversions yada 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 but if you're just going the simple route of like i just want to i want it to be easy later for me to go from single to double precision or vice versa then yeah have one parameter defined in a module that everything uses
if some free time, maybe a few general ideas on how to call Fortran compiled modules from Python or MATLAB. Ooh. Um, I haven't done a ton of it. I do know that I've done a little bit with Python, not a ton with MATLAB. There are some idiosyncrasies. Uh, I know there's a project called f to pi that I think I think is part of the NumPy project. Um, so if you've got NumPy installed somewhere, you probably have f to pi. So probably we have it on Perlmutter. With MATLAB, I think you can do uh, yeah. uh, files. And uh, I forgot if it has to be C or can be Fortran. Uh, I MATLAB was designed kind of after Fortran, or the, they they had a goal of being Fortran like in their syntax and and usage at least a little bit. Um, I think I think even the original implementation was written in Fortran. But anyway, uh, I I do know that it is possible to interoperate MATLAB and Fortran, but I'm not as familiar with the tools to do it. Um, f to pi is supposed to be able to take a given Fortran module and write the Python wrapper that lets you be able to call it with some constraints and caveats. Like, I think the you have to use assumed size arrays or assume, or explicit shape arrays, right, where one of the arguments defines the shape, the size of the array or whatever. Um, it can interrupt. They, they can interrupt with. Uh, NumPy arrays, though. Um, it doesn't work very well for object-oriented code. Like if you if you have if you're defining your derived types, which we'll talk about tomorrow, if you're defining derived types with type-bound procedures, like you can't just use the Python syntax to call derived type type-bound procedures. It just doesn't quite work like that. Um, But basically, anything you could do with bind C, you could do with f to pi. That being said, you can just do bind C and use the C interoperability features of Python to interoperate with Fortran, right? So basically, any language that can interoperate with C can interoperate with Fortran. Basically, that language thinks it's interoperating with C, and Fortran thinks it's interoperating with C. So they both think they're talking to C, but they're talking to each other. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh -huh. No. Find C and then call Fortran for Python. Yep. Uh, MATLAB's got their documentation. Yep. Good stuff. If there are any more questions, we can we can get in. We got five minutes left. We can answer a few more quick questions. Feel free to raise your hand or just unmute and ask if if you want. But um, I'll give it I'll give it a sec. If anybody's got some, and then if not, we can give you five minutes of your day back. Well, all right. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. This has been fun. Uh, hope to see you all again tomorrow for day two, where we will talk about derived types going parallel. Um, we can spend as much time on those as you want. Be, free, be sure to ask questions. We'll, we'll have lots of discussions. And then with whatever time we still have after lunch, we'll do some demos about FPM. Uh, I, as of this morning, we have an FPM module available on Perlmutter, so we'll so you'll get a chance to play with that. Uh, and then we can start talking about unit testing, which is uh, 
something that I'm passionate about. I have a library for doing unit testing, um, but I, I've I've got a presentation that I gave a couple of years ago at Fortran Con that kind of describes how, how I think about unit testing and and some examples in Fortran. But hopefully I'll see you all again tomorrow. Uh, I'll have the recordings up and talk to you all later. So a quick reminder that the compute node reservation and in one more hour so you can use it still. Thank you very much.